Okay, so today we're going to talk a bit about valve disease, which is lots of fun. I'm going to start by telling you what you should remember, and then you can go to sleep, and I'll wake you up when I hit you in the face with candy. Um, first, importantly, you can't fix a mechanical problem with medicines. Valve disease is a mechanical obstruction or leaking of a valve, and there are no medicines which fully fix or fully compensate for the problem. So the best we can do is kind of temporize things. If you have symptoms, you replace the valve. That's very simple, straightforward, so it sounds. Discovering whether the symptoms come from the valve disease is important, but at the point where I wish you have symptoms, that's the time when it's always time to replace the valve. Um, aortic stenosis is the valve disease we're going to spend the most time talking about today because it's probably the one you guys are going to encounter the most, and it's also the one where you can do the most harm. It's a preload-dependent state, so if you remember nothing else that I tell you, remember that and its consequences. The mainstays of treatment for aortic stenosis are diuresis, afterload reduction, and avoid big hemodynamic shifts, and we'll talk a bit about how to do all of those. And then, in the words of Gary Gerstenblith, one of my mentors, the enemy of good is perfect. So if you have a patient with critical valve disease and they're doing good, doing well, don't try to make them even better than that with your medications because you're probably going to hurt them. So this is what calcific or senile aortic stenosis looks like. You end up with these sort of chunks of calcium and atherosclerosis deposited on the valve leaflets, and that restricts the mobility of the leaflet. So instead of opening, they should be this beautiful, thin, little wispy layer. They become hard, calcified, chunky, and then they end up having a difficult time opening. I'm going to tell you a story to start today because this is one of my favorite and um, most satisfying patients I've taken care of. We affectionately referred to this woman as Mrs. Huckabuck because when we would ask her, oh, you know, how did your day go yesterday? Would you have all that testing done? She said, well, they took me downstairs and they did the Huckabuck. I have no idea what that means, but that's why we called her Mrs. Huckabuck. So she was an 85-year-old matriarch of her family. She first presented to us with dyspnea on exertion while walking to church and also had some lower extremity edema. She denied chest pain, palpitations, orthopnea, PND, or syncope. Her past medical history was significant for the fact that she really didn't like to go to doctors, but what we gathered from previous times that she'd been in the hospital or clinic is that she has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and in 2005, which this um, story I'm telling you is from 2011, so six years prior, she'd actually had mild to moderate aortic stenosis on an echocardiogram that she wasn't really aware of and nothing had been done. And at that time, she had an aortic valve area of one and a mean gradient of 18. I'm going to teach you a little bit about how to think about those things, but this put her in the mild to moderate range. On physical exam, when we saw her, she was afebrile, she was hypertensive, tachycardic, she was on two liters of nasal cannula, and a little bit tachypnic. So importantly, her heart was irregularly irregular, and she had a three out of six crescendo decrescendo systolic ejection murmur at the left upper, upper sternal border radiating to the clavicles. What did I just tell you that she has? When you hear that exam and you're reading a board's question, what does the person have? Aortic stenosis. I don't know who said that. There you go. <clears throat> Importantly, she had an absent S2. We'll talk about the significance of that. Her JVP was elevated to 12 centimeters of water, and there was no LV heave. Lungs had bilateral crackles, a little bit of wheezing, and was dull at the right base. And then she had one plus bilateral lower extremity edema, but she was warm and well perfused. So, of course, after we heard this exam, of course, we said, let's get an echo, right? She has a murmur. Let's get an echo. That's what we all do. So her ejection fraction was reduced at 35%. Her right ventricle also had mild to moderate global hypokinesis. But here in red, so you see what's important, her aortic valve area was now down to 0.6 centimeters squared with a mean gradient of 40. A little bit of AI, moderate MR, TR, and a right ventricular systolic pressure of 60. So all of this is pointing to bad aortic valve disease. This is a picture of her, a video of her echo. And what I want to show you particularly as it loops, so this is which chamber the my pointer is in? Anyone know? Left atrium. Left atrium, this one, left ventricle, and this right here. So see that pile of rocks? That's supposed to be her aortic valve. The leaflets should be a lot thinner than this, and they should open, and then they come down into the hands of prayer position. You can see here they're hardly moving at all. When you see this, you actually already know they have some degree of aortic stenosis even before you've gone through all the measurements. So through a um, series of randomizations and discussions with the patient, given her age and her comorbidities, we actually enrolled her in the trial that was ongoing at the time for TAVR, or transcutaneous aortic valve replacement, which you may have heard of. We do it over at Jewish. This is actually when I was in Baltimore at Hopkins. 
So there's, at that time, sort of two different manufacturers of valves. I just want to give you a sense of them. Not Med Metronic, but Medtronic makes something called the core valve. So there's basically a chicken wire, and then these are valve leaflets. They're made out of pericardium from pig or cow, so it's very thin layer like that. They're sewn onto this. The whole apparatus can be crunched down into a tiny fashion, loaded onto a catheter, and then implanted. Um, and the Medtronic core valves, you can see here, here's where the coronaries take off. This is where the aortic valve annulus is, and it has sort of this um, large landing area. It's self-expanding, so that means after you put it in, it keeps getting a little bit bigger over time. <clears throat> this is the Edward Sapien valve, a little bit of a different design, doesn't have that big landing area. Um, this is the one that was studied in the partner's trial, so this is one of the more original valve designs. And you can see here, this is when it's crimped down upon its loading apparatus, and see that balloon up there is inflated inside the stent, or inside the core valve, sorry, the Edward Sapien valve, so that now it's expanded. But you can see the whole thing can get crimped down to about the size of that catheter. So I'll show you because it's fun and awesome. If anyone's never seen, this is gonna be the fluoro images from her procedure. So um, first, you'll notice a couple of things. Does anyone know what this is right here? Any idea? I think I hear it. So not quite epicardial, but this is a transvenous pacer coming up from her groin. So she was doing everything from groin access. So this is a transvenous pacer. Um, the reason for that is twofold. The first one is at the moment of deployment for the um, tavern, you can't have the ventricle just squeezing like normal. Because if it does, it'll just pop the valve right out of place. So what you actually do is you pace them rapidly at the moment that you deploy the valve so the ventricle isn't really having much stroke volume, and that makes it easier to place it. The other reason is that in case you knock off the conduction system as you're doing this procedure, you have a temporary pacemaker in place. So that's the temporary pacemaker. And then this is the catheter coming up from her leg, up her aorta, over the aortic arch. And that's a pigtail catheter just squirting contrast right at the aortic valve annulus. Now you can see the contrast going back down in there. She has a little bit of aortic insufficiency as well. You see that, how the contrast comes back down in the ventricle? That's because when the valve has a hard time opening, it also has a hard time closing. So oftentimes people will have mixed disease when they have aortic stenosis. So that's just them getting the shot. You can also see the coronaries are getting filled here because they're right at the ostium at the aortic annulus. So you see that's the left side, that's the right side. Okay, now, oops. Now you have the whole apparatus loaded. So we've moved the camera a little bit, but you still see <clears throat> coming up from the groin around the aorta, you have that pigtail still in the annulus of the aorta. And then this is the valve apparatus. Does anyone know what that is up there? That's a TEE probe that's in place to help you position everything because they use fluoro and TEE. And this is that um, core valve. You, I know it's a core valve because it's long, and it's crimped down to this size in the catheter. There's a balloon inside it that's going to help to expand it, and it's over a wire. The wire goes down in the ventricle. So this is getting the placement just right. Now, each valve has a little bit different characteristics, <clears throat> but here it's halfway deployed. So they've started to actually slip off what's outside of it, keeping it in and it's starting to be deployed, and they're making sure the position is correct because at this point in time, they could still reposition if they want to. And you can see that some of the chicken wire, for lack of a better term, is gonna be down in the ventricle, and the rest of it's gonna be up in the aorta. Now, you still see that there is, again, now more aortic insufficiency. The reason for that is before you deploy the valve, you actually do a valvuloplasty. So you just blow up a balloon, <laughs> right in that aortic valve to kind of open up the calcified leaflets to make room for this. So you create some more AI when you do that. And then finally, here's a fully deployed valve. <clears throat> so the TEE is still in, the transvenous pacemaker is still in, but that whole valve apparatus is gone and you just have this pigtail catheter. And you're squirting now above the pericardium leaflets. And as you can see, there is a little bit of contrast going down in the ventricle. That's perivalvular leak because, you know, you've deployed this, but you still have sometimes areas around the valve where some blood can leak through. And that's important to see how well people do. But for the most part, the aortic insufficiency is gone. And if you looked at hemodynamics, you've cured her aortic valve disease and all without cutting open the chest. So now I'm going to teach you how to do this. Just kidding.
That's just for fun because it's awesome that we can do this, right? And this is a technology that has been developed in the course of my training. So I, when I was a resident, I went to Australia and saw them do, um, they actually were doing an apical cut down haver before I ever saw one in the U.S. at Hopkins. So this is like relatively new technology that's really exciting and changed the course of things. So this is she and I before she got her TAVR. That's at one of her hospital uh, visit, follow-up visits. And I just got a text a couple of weeks ago with another picture of her doing great. And she's now five years out. If we hadn't fixed that valve, she would be dead by now. So let's talk about how first, going backwards now, how do you make the diagnosis of aortic stenosis? So what might you see or hear or feel on physical exam? Anyone? A murmur. Is that you, Nelson? I think so. No? Oh. I'll relay Okay, murmur. What kind of a murmur? Crescendo, decrescendo. So that means shh, shh. Uh huh. Systolic murmur. Good. Systolic murmur. That's important, right? You have to know the difference between systolic and diastolic. Where should you hear it? Left or right upper, ster upper, I always say that, upper sternal border. Someone gets candy. That's a box. Watch out. Um, okay. And where else? Sorry? Describe what you mean. That is a, that's the person referred to the office. So the, uh, basically, it's a point of the area that the house is talking about the south of yeah, so there are a couple of different uh, a couple of different places where it can be referred. Most classically, we think about the murmur radiating, and we think about it radiating up through the carotids, right, because the jet is directed this way. There can be some fancy ways that the jets flow and can impact other valve lesions, but for the sake of simplicity, we usually think about it radiating to the carotids, okay? What else on physical exam? What might you feel? Oh, yeah. That's not even, not anywhere close. Pulses parvus at tardis. Can you explain what that is? Good. So slow and blunted, right? That's exactly what it means. So, yeah, a tardy. And so that's the slow part and less um, full than what it normally would be. So if you feel the pulse of you or I, it should feel like a nice, like a, like a good sort of punch right under your finger, right? Usually when you're feeling older people's pulse because of the calcified arteries, what do their pulse usually feel like? It's even more pronounced, right? You'll usually have that very pronounced quick pulse in an older person. And in someone with aortic stenosis, it's going to be more like rolling. So it feels like a roll underneath your finger when you're feeling the pulse. And it's delayed compared to when you're hearing the heart sounds. So that's a very classic and important sign for aortic stenosis. Anything else that you might see on physical exam? So they might be in heart failure, right? So you might have elevated jugular venous pressure. You might have crackles. And depending upon what's happening to their left ventricle, you might get left ventricular hypertrophy. So you might actually end up with an LV heave at the end of all of that. Okay. Now, importantly, <clears throat> I talked about the S2. So the most sensitive physical exam finding for aortic stenosis, for the severity of aortic stenosis is what? <laughs> Oh, I gave it away. I shouldn't have asked it that way. Yes. Whoa. Nope. Not going to happen. <clears throat> so p sometimes people will say, well, the loudness of the murmur, that doesn't necessarily help you with severity. Or they'll say how far it radiates. That can, but the best thing to correlate with severity is how loud or how absent the S2 is. Now think about an absent S2, what that means. What is an S2? What does that signify? Closure of what? Closure of the aortic valve and pulmonic valves, right? But if you're just thinking of the aortic component, that's the A2. So it's closure of the aortic valve. And the reason that we hear it is because it's opening and closing. If you have a chunky calcified valve and it barely opens, you're not going to hear it when it closes. So absence of an S2 is a thing that makes me the most concerned about the severity of a person's aortic stenosis. Okay, what symptoms are classically associated with aortic stenosis? <laughs> Syncope, and what else? Chest pain and? And dyspnea. Good. So people get candy. I don't know who. Everybody gets candy. You're not awake over there. Okay. 
<clears throat> so syncope, angina, and dyspnea. And I like to remember them in this order, ASD. Angina, then syncope, then dyspnea. Because those have differences in the prognosis in terms of survival. And it's in order from least bad to most bad. So it's kind of always surprised me that syncope has a better prognosis than dyspnea. Dyspnea really signals heart failure. So once you have heart failure symptoms, that's actually the worst prognosis of the three. Then on echo, you don't have to know this as medicine, but for those who are interested in cardiology, and if you just want a general sense of what do you remember for severity of aortic stenosis, you just have to remember 4 and 40. So the jet velocity is how fast the blood is ejecting out of the aortic valve. And you all did this when you were kids, right? You take a hose and you put your finger over it to make it tighter. And what happens to the velocity? It increases, right? You want to spray your brother? You just put the finger over the hose. Not that I ever wanted to do that. But if you wanted to spray your brother, you'd make the opening smaller and the velocity goes up. So if the velocity is above four centimeters per, or sorry, four meters per second, that's severe aortic stenosis. And then the gradient, I think that makes sense, right? That's just the difference in pressure between the left ventricle and the aorta. Normally, when the aortic valve is open, there should be no pressure difference, right? Because it's fully open. But if the aortic valve gets stenotic, doesn't open fully, there'll be a pressure difference. And if that's 40 millimeters of mercury or greater, that's severe. So 4 or 40 is what we remember about severity. That, that can be useful for you because if you read a report and they're like moderate to severe and you're not sure and you go and look, sometimes we get measurements that one is moderate and one is severe. And then the job of the echocardiographer is to try and figure out which it is. But you as the clinician might know this person has symptoms. So therefore, regardless, it's going to be in the severe category. Okay, so how do we manage these people if we just discover this incidentally on echo? Raise your hand if you've ever discovered aortic stenosis incidentally on an echo. Yeah, way more of you. You're not looking then, okay? Because at the VA, everybody's got some amount of aortic stenosis, right? So <clears throat> we treat these people. Um, we don't really have any good uh, treatment that can prolong their course or can improve survival. So in general, we do things like afterload reduction. So you're just treating their hypertension, which is good to do anyway. You can use standard therapy. Just be cautious with vasodilators because remember I told you aortic stenosis is a preload dependent state. So if you give them a bunch of venodilators, once the aortic stenosis is severe enough, they won't have enough preload to get through the valve and out. So be careful with those. And then we treat them for risk factors. So someone had this great idea that this seems to be an atherosclerotic calcific process, so that statins are good for everything. Why don't we give statins to people with AS and see what happens? Unfortunately, it did not slow the progression of the disease. But statins are still good for all these people anyway for their prevention of cardiovascular or coronary heart disease and cerebrovascular disease. So everybody gets it, but don't think you're doing them any good for the aortic stenosis with the statin. Long time ago, people used to think you had to give endocarditis prophylaxis because the valve is abnormal. It's not recommended anymore. And then most importantly, aortic stenosis goes along with all these other diseases, coronary disease, hypertension, strokes, AFib. So make sure you're adequately treating all of their concomitant disease. And then you need to monitor them. So when you have someone in your clinic who has moderate aortic stenosis, that person needs a yearly or every other year echo because you're watching for progression of that aortic stenosis. If it's already in the severe range based on those measurements I taught you, but they don't yet have symptoms, you have to monitor them more closely because you're expecting that the valve is going to progress and that you're going to need to intervene sooner rather than later. This, this graph is from 1968, and it hasn't changed. This is one of the most classic graphs in cardiology. This is average survival, and this is from the time of severe symptoms. Usually we show this graph as a straight line, and then as soon as the symptoms show up, bam, survival starts to drop. And this is based upon which symptom you have. So angina, the average survival is five years. 50% of people dead at five years. Syncope, three years. But heart failure or dyspnea, average survival, two years. So that means half of your patients who have symptoms of heart failure and severe aortic stenosis will be dead in two years if you don't do anything about it. That's what I just said. Okay. So let's discuss a little bit, because we have to talk about mechanism, about how we get to some of the symptoms. So angina, how do we get angina? Well, this is actually twofold. So first, you could understand how you would get decreased coronary perfusion, because remember that the coronaries take off after the aortic valve in the aorta. So if you're not getting enough blood through, then you might not be getting enough through the coronaries. Um, however, most of the time, these people have a decreased diastolic blood pressure, 
and um, decreased um, reflected pressure wave. Do you guys understand what that means? No, I'm going to tell you. Okay. So when you and I, when we have, hopefully, we all have nice compliant arterial trees. So we have our systolic pressure wave goes forward, right? And then that pressure gets absorbed into all the arterioles, but some of it's going to get reflected back. And do you know when it gets reflected back? During which phase of the cycle? Diastole, right? Okay. Now, in people with stiff vessels, the pressure wave goes out, and then what happens? It pings right back in because they have stiff, non-compliant vascular tree. So that's why older people have this really wide pulse pressure. Their reflected pressure wave is coming back during systole instead of during diastole. So that's why you get some of these people with a pressure of like 160 over 60. Now, they might have aortic insufficiency, but most likely they just have a stiff tree. So that also worsens coronary perfusion in the elderly because the diastolic blood pressure is lower. And when do the coronaries perfuse? Which phase of the cardiac cycle? Diastole. Okay, so that's kind of a two for there. Now, also, a lot of these people, this is the same risk factors for aortic stenosis are the risk factors for coronary disease. So a lot of them have obstructive coronary disease, which can also lead to angina. So one of our job as cardiologists ends up being sorting out, is there angina coming from the aortic stenosis, or is it coming from the coronary disease? Let's put a stent in the coronary and see what happens to their symptoms. Syncope, that may, that's pretty straightforward, right? Decreased cerebral perfusion because of the decreased um, output, but also a lot of these people have concomitant carotid disease. And then finally, in terms of dyspnea or heart failure, so there's a couple of things going on here. First, you have this gradient across the aortic valve, okay? That's making that the end diastolic pressure in the left ventricle is higher than normal. That is going to lead to concentric hypertrophy because the LV is trying to augment its systolic function, trying to pump against that tighter, tighter valve. That, when you have LVH, you have de often you have impaired relaxation, so your diastolic filling gets delayed. That gives decreased time for the atrial to ventricular filling, and that leads to pulmonary congestion. So yes, there's a mechanical obstruction of the valve, but there's also all this other stuff going on, which leads to pulmonary congestion. Additionally, eventually that left ventricle can fail because it's pumping against a brick wall. And a left ventricle can try to hypertrophy to compensate, but eventually it may decrease and cause low left ventricular um, ejection fraction. Okay, hemodynamics, my favorite. So this is hopefully you and I and everyone in this room. So this is during systole, right? The aortic valve is open. And you can see the systolic pressure in the left ventricle is the same as in the aorta, 120. And if you were to put a catheter up here in the aorta to measure the pressure and another one down here in the LV to measure the pressure, which we do this in the cath lab, you'd get these two pressure tracings. Red is the aorta, so your nice dichrotic notch when the aortic valve closes. Blue is the left ventricle. This should look very familiar to you as the pressure tracing for the left ventricle. This is the end diastolic pressure down here. And you would see that the systolic pressures are exactly the same because the valve is open and there's no gradient between them. So this is normal. Now, what about if that valve gets really tight? So now the left ventricle has to augment and try to get a much bigger systolic pressure to squeeze out through this tight area. So the left ventricular systolic pressure is 200 and the aortic is only 110. So even though the person has systemic hypotension, their left ventricular pressures are really high. So now if I put in two catheters, here the left ventricle is in green and the aorta is in red, you can see that there's a big difference between the left ventricular systolic pressure and the aortic systolic pressure. Does everyone appreciate that? This peak-to-peak -peak gradient, as we call it, is actually the most accurate measure of how bad the aortic stenosis is. So we will, when we often can't figure out how bad is the aortic stenosis, we'll go and do this in the cath lab to get a definitive invasive answer. And, sorry? Right, yep, exactly, 36 millimeters of mercury, so essentially 40 here. Oh, is that the cutoff there? Uh, I believe so. Uh, 40 is what we measure on echo, and I believe on peak to peak it should also be 40, yes. So here's what that looks like in the cath lab, and we actually can color it in. So see the left ventricle is the big tracings, and the aorta are those smaller arterial tracings, and you can see the difference between these. Now when we do a TAVR, what's awesome is that this gradient completely goes away. So you take a snapshot at the beginning of the case, and then 40 minutes later at the end of the case, and it goes back to looking normal, which is so sweet. Okay, so surgical treatment of aortic stenosis. Again, this is a very famous graph from 1982. This is a survival with no surgery. This is a survival with surgery. No question about it. Huge difference in survival. So that, this is from 1982. 
So we know that there's a pronounced mortality for patients with symptomatic AS. So all these patients had symptom, symptoms. And aortic valve replacement surgical has been the standard of care for many years. And the ideal timing of the operation was the day of symptom onset, because we know that their survival doesn't start to decrease until they start to have symptoms. So our goal was to find people the day before they got symptoms. That's impossible. Although I feel like I found it once, that they were like right there. She had maybe stopped going up the stairs as quickly as usual. Actually, that's an important point. So when you're asking people about their exercise tolerance to get a sense of, is this symptomatic or not, people, without realizing it, will have modified their degree of activity to compensate for this. So instead of just asking them, do you ever get short-winded when you walk up the stairs, maybe they say yes, maybe they say no. What I'll ask is, okay, so right now, if we went for a walk, how far can you go without stopping? You know, that's a standard question. But then I'll say, take me back six months ago. What could you do back then? Or I'll pick a holiday. Take me back to last Christmas. Because people without knowing it will have slowly decreased their activity. So sometimes the only symptom you'll get is what we call decrease in exercise tolerance or self-limiting the activity. That counts. You can send them for evaluation. So in the 2006 guidelines, I know this is busy, but the important thing here was symptoms, yes or no. Yes, symptoms, you get the surgery. No symptoms, try really hard to find some other reason why they can get surgery. <laughs> That's kind of what this slide says. So if you were getting cabbage, if you had a decreased ejection fraction on exercise testing, it could augment the blah, blah, blah. You look for another reason and you try to get the aortic valve replacement. So that's 2006. That is not that long ago. I was just finishing. I'm not even going to tell you. Okay. Then came along the TAVR uh, partners trial. Have it, has everyone heard of the partners trial or does that sound familiar at all? So partners is what started this whole TAVR craze. Partners was done by some really gutsy people actually at Columbia. And several of my friends were residents during the partners trial. And they were like, oh man, you did not want to take care of the partners patients because these were trial patients, right? So everything had to be perfect. It was really high stress. They basically took non-operative candidates. So these are people mostly in their 80s who had symptomatic severe aortic stenosis but had other comorbidities that made their surgical risk prohibitively high, so too high mortality, et cetera. And they got randomized to medical therapy. What did I tell you at the beginning of this is the medical treatment for aortic stenosis? There's no medical treatment for severe aortic stenosis. So they got randomized to medical therapy or TAVR. And you can see here, huge difference in mortality, absolute reduction of 27%. In modern cardiology, you do not see very many things that have an absolute reduction of 27% in mortality, which is pretty good. All cause mortality. Now, people still die, right? 50% of the people who got tavern are still dead at 36 months because these are older people who have a lot of comorbidities. But you've significantly dropped that mortality rate. Um, they looked at stroke because that's the trade-off. You're going into a calcified senile aorta, pff, blowing up balloons, chunks of calcium can tend to fly upstairs. So stroke, there was more stroke in the TAVR patient, 15 versus 5%. But when you combine mortality and stroke, it was still overall benefiting TAVR. So this was the first trial that made TAVR on the map for non-operative candidates, Okay. There are some risks of TAVR, though. Stroke, I mentioned. Aortic dissection, you're in there. Calcified aorta, you can just make a nice dissection flap. Paravalvular leak, I spoke about a little bit at the beginning, where you can have blood refluxing around the outside of the valve. That's bad because you're volume loading the ventricle. So that actually leads to a worse prognosis. And then remember that your conduction system is pretty, your AV node is right up next to your aortic valve. So people who get surgical AVRs all come out of the operating room with temporary pacemakers because most of the time they have edema of their AV node. Here, you're not cutting open and cutting around that, but you are blowing up this balloon. So people can often get a left bundle branch block or AV block. And in fact, if you have a left bundle afterwards, worse prognosis. And some of these people end up getting pacemakers, same hospital stay. Oh, that was my next point. Look at me go. And then finally, bleeding, because you are going into the groin with some pretty big cannulas. And so these people can have groin complications. So now as of 2014, class one recommendation for TAVR, if they have prohibitive risk for surgery, class 2A, which means probably a pretty good idea, as an alternative who have high surgical risk. This field of study has now exploded. So 
every year there's a new study with a new valve in a different patient population, and probably pretty soon it'll be indicated in me. But <laughs> at this point in time, it's actually shown to be equivalent, if not better, than surgical in many different patient populations. So a lot of people are now ending up getting TAVRs. Okay, so a, a brief um, discussion about inpatient management, because this is when you might encounter these patients in the CCU, someone comes in decompensated, but usually what we find is this. An 80-year-old guy, history of hypertension, diabetes, tobacco abuse, comes in with chest pain with exertion, and now he's having chest pain at rest. So what's on your differential? What's the first thing you think of when you hear that? Everybody thinks of unstable angina. People got candy for that. Okay. And what do you usually do when someone comes into the emergency department having active chest pain? Give them what? Okay, that's what you guys do. What does the ER do? Yes, they give them nitro, right? You've got chest pain, I have nitro. <clears throat> Why would nitro be a terrible idea in someone with aortic stenosis? Right? Hello, your veins go like this, vasodilation. So all the blood, instead of getting returned to the heart, is now pooling in this big sink that you created by making big veins. It can't get through, and therefore you have less preload, and you can make them syncopize or die. Now, how does aortic stenosis present? <laughs> Just like this. I told you angina is a symptom of aortic stenosis. And what are the risk factors for aortic stenosis? All of these things, the same things that are risk factors for coronary disease. So in my opinion, it is medical malpractice to give nitroglycerin to a person without listening to their chest first. It's probably a good idea to examine patients before giving them any therapy. But in particular, because of this risk, it's not insignificant to give someone nitroglycerin. Do you know how much nitro is in one of those little tablets? It's 0.4 milligrams, right? Okay, so that's 400 micrograms. How much, when you start a drip for someone on a nitro drip, what do you start them at? Five or 10 mics per minute? So you want to give them 400 at once? That's a great way to drop the blood pressure, right? That's why you have to take the blood pressure every time before you give a nitro. So if you have someone who is, you know, an older person, 70, 75, or have some other risk factor for aortic stenosis like bicuspid valve disease, which they should hopefully know, and they come in with chest pain, don't give them nitroglycerin. Listen to the chest first. If you hear no murmur, great. If you hear a raging murmur with no S2, probably don't give them nitro. If you hear, a, if you hear like a moderate murmur, you're probably still okay, right? It's only the severe aortic stenosis people that are going to get into trouble here. Okay. So I want to teach you how, in the remaining time how to kill patients with critical AS when they're in the hospital in the hopes that you will avoid this. So give nitro for all chest pain, right? Give pure venous vasodilators to reduce preload. Hydralazine falls into that category. Aim for this perfect blood pressure of 120 over 80 in my 80-year-old hypertensive patient. Why is that a problem? 120 over 80, isn't that good? Yeah, remember cerebral perfusion pressure? Remember how the brain regulates it of, over a wide variety of blood pressure? When you've had longstanding hypertension, your brain shifts that autoregulation over. And so it's going to allow for normal cerebral perfusion at higher pressures, which means at normal pressures, you're going to have lower cerebral perfusion. So this is a great way to make them syncopize. Remember I said the enemy of good is perfect? So don't aim for perfect blood pressure in the inpatient setting with these people who have aortic stenosis. Fast and furious diuresis, but they're overloaded. They can't breathe. Let's get four liters off, right? I mean, you guys know I like to be aggressive in my diuresis, not in these guys, because they have extravascular volume. Intravascular volume is a very delicate balance. So maybe 500 cc's net negative a day, maybe, if you can get away with it. And then just that AFib at 140, I mean, you know, they're okay. Just let them go. The problem is with this, they're really dependent upon um, timing to fill. And if you stay, keep, let them stay in rapid AFib, they'll often decompensate. So don't do those things. Okay, so instead, how to not kill patients with critical aortic stenosis. So you must examine, I think I've said this 17 times before giving nitroglycerin. Remember, it's a preload-dependent state. So whatever you give, try not to impact preload. You, can, you want to give them after load reduction. So you do want to get the blood pressure down, right? Because you want to make it easier for the ventricle to pump, and the lower the afterload to a certain point, the easier it is to pump. But don't aim for normal tension. The agents you can use are beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. Whoo, nitroprusside used with caution, people, and probably only in the CCU under my direction. But it is possible to use this effectively here. 
If they're wet, you can diurese them, but be slowly, but do it slowly, right? Start low, go slow. This is our general principle for geriatric population. And every once in a while, we'll need to do something more intense. If this person really, they're intubated, high oxygen requirement, we can't get them off, or they're starting to get hypotensive with this critical AS, these are great people to get balloon pumps. Why would a balloon pump help them? If they don't have AI. Any idea? It's okay, the fellows don't even know this answer to this question. So what a balloon pump really does is decrease the diastolic blood pressure. It's an afterload-reducing agent. It inflates during diastole and then whoosh, makes a vacuum. So it's actually overall decreases afterload. So it's a mechanical way to do that without decreasing the MAP. So it will allow you to maintain perfusion to the organs, but it will decrease afterload and make it easier to pump. So this is a, a trick we often go to in decompensated aortic stenosis. And then every once in a while, if, they're, if they can't get a TAVR right away and things are really bad, we can do a valvuloplasty. So that's just where we blow up a balloon inside the aortic valve. It usually gets us about 0.5 centimeters squared of extra area, but in three months' time, it's going to close down again. So this is just a temporizing measure. Try to get them off the vent. Try to get them better enough to get to a TAVR. And then we talked a little bit about AFib, which is detrimental because it decreases LV filling. So you might have to do a TE cardioversion. You might be able to rate control them depending upon their hemodynamics. But this can get very tricky if someone's hypotensive, heart rate of 130 on the ventilator with critical aortic stenosis. Woo, that's why I have a job. Okay, um, balloon pump, we talked about already. Just remember that if they have a lot of AI, you don't want to be blowing up a balloon during diastole and putting more blood backwards. So that would be one, if the person has mixed valvular disease and there's a lot of AI, then we won't do this. Okay, um, for the sake of time, I'm going to go on to just a few other things. Who's heard of Hades syndrome? Okay, so you know about this, right? Angiodysplasia of the GI tract. It's an acquired von Willebrand's fan factor deficiency. This is kind of awesome. A mechanical problem with the valve leads to you developing AVMs and cleaving this ultra-long von Willebrand's factor. Um, and then that makes the platelets get cleared more, and then you get GI bleeding. This is awesome because you can fix GI bleeding with a surgery, not of the GI tract. <laughs> So this is interesting when we discover this, this can be a reason why we end up replacing the aortic valve, even if they don't have symptoms. If it's severe enough to be causing this and we're, con we're convinced that it's Hades syndrome, then we'll sometimes replace the aortic valve. Okay, um, we don't have time to go through all the other valves, so we'll do it another time, but I just wanna end with, again, remembering the take home points, and really we only talked about aortic stenosis today. You can't fix a mechanical problem with medicines. You can temporize things, but you need some mechanical problem. If they have symptoms, replace the valve. Preload-dependent state, we treat them with diuretics, afterload reduction, and avoid big hemodynamic shifts until we get them definitive therapy. And then the enemy of good is perfect. And finally, mistakes. It could be that the purpose of your life is to only serve as a warning for others. So don't make mistakes when it comes to critical aortic stenosis so that you're not telling your future interns in the future like, oh, this one time. Don't do that. I've taught you how to not. Any questions about critical aortic stenosis management? All right, thanks, guys.